Most physicists want to believe that information is not lost, because that would mean the world would be safe and predictable. Nothing unexpected could happen. But I feel that if one takes Einstein's general theory of relativity seriously, one must allow the possibility that space-time ties itself in a knot, and information gets lost in the folds. If the Starship Enterprise can go through a wormhole, one must expect a surprise. I know. I was on board the Enterprise, playing poker with Newton, Einstein, and Data, and look who appeared on my knee. <laughs> Thank you for listening. Almost had a happy ending. <laughs> Thanks very much for that wonderful lecture. I'm sure there are many questions that have occurred to people in the audience, and I hope that people will write them on their cards and pass those cards across the aisles to the, to the edges, and the ushers will pick them up. And then they're going to be given to two of uh, Professor Hawking's Long-time friends and colleagues, uh, professors at Caltech, John Preskill and Kip Thorne. They will sort through the questions and select several to be answered. And while the answers are being prepared, Preskill and Thorne will tell you about the various systems that Dr. Hawkins uses uh, in his computer and his voice synthesis system, how he does his research and some of his scientific discoveries. So let me turn things over to John Preskill. Well, thank you very much, David, and thank you, Stephen, for that exciting lecture. You know, Einstein thought that everything should be as simple as possible, but no simpler. And I think we can appreciate the effort Stephen went to to make his lecture nearly as simple as possible, but also be confident that it was no simpler. My colleague, Kip Thorne, is going to receive the cards with your questions, and he's accepted the difficult assignment of choosing one of those questions to ask Stephen. Uh, I can offer you my personal assurance that Kip is well qualified for that assignment. He, he may even be overqualified, but he's going to do the best he can. And anyway, while Kip is frantically sifting through hundreds of cards, searching for that one perfect question, I'll seize the opportunity to ask the first, uh, albeit imperfect, question myself. Stephen, one of the provocative remarks you made in your lecture was you said the experimental evidence for string theory is even less than for astrology. Uh, however, we believe it because it is consistent with tested theories. And one of the main points of your lecture was to raise the question, does information get permanently lost inside a black hole or can it get out somehow? But you didn't answer the question. Now, I'm not demanding an answer right now, but I would like to know your opinion. Is this a question that we can answer 
that we can resolve just by pure thought, by demanding consistency with tested theories? Or do you think that we'll need some kind of guidance from experiments, say, to lead us to a definitive answer? The question is, how are we going to find out whether black holes destroy information or not, in your opinion? So Stephen's going to prepare an answer to the question, and while he does that, let me explain a little bit about what he's doing. On the screen attached to his chair, there's a menu of words that he can select from by using the clicker that he holds in, in his hand. In the main menu, there are common words and phrases, yes, no, thanks, and so forth, and also letters of the alphabet. So let's say he wants to say the word future. He can select the letter F from the main menu, and then he'll see a list of words beginning with F. He can scroll through them by moving the clicker, and when he highlights the word that he wants, he clicks, and that word appears on the bottom half of his screen. And that way, he can build up a sentence, one word at a time, to make an answer uh, several sentences long will, will take him several minutes. Once he has the text that he wants on the screen, then he can speak using the voice that we heard tonight, or he can save uh, those sentences on his hard disk if he wants to. That's how he composes his scientific papers and how he prepared the lecture that we heard tonight. Now, you've already heard that Stephen had an exciting adventure last week. Uh, last Friday, he gave an invited lecture at the wide White House that was widely televised. And the day before the lecture on Thursday, he met privately for half an hour in the Oval Office with the President and Mrs. Clinton. Well, I understand that Bill was kind of nervous before that meeting. Um, someone heard him say, Hillary, what am I going to say to Stephen Hawking? I mean, he knows that you're the smart one. <laughs> and Well, Hillary said, oh, just be yourself, Bill. He's not expecting you to say anything intelligent. Um, <laughs> So, um, so Bill asked Stephen to come by. Uh, he said, can you come by at 10.30? Stephen actually isn't an early riser, so he said, I can be there at 11. And Bill said, okay, that's fine, because I think secretly he was glad to have an extra half hour to prepare. So finally it's 11, and, and uh, Stephen rolls into the Oval Office. Bill and Hillary are waiting for him. And Stephen immediately starts to compose a question to ask the President of the United States. Well, Bill is worried, right? I mean, he's perspiring. A little bead of sweat is on the tip of his nose. He, what's Stephen going to ask him, right? Now, finally, Stephen has his question ready, and he says, when you were at Oxford, was the food there as bad as it was when I was there? <laughs> so it turns out that Bill and Stephen actually had a lot in common, and I, I understand that they had a pretty nice chat. Uh, Stephen had his White House lecture all prepared in advance, but when he arrived there, he was chagrined to find out about the gag rule, you know, no Monica jokes at the White House. So <laughs> he, uh, he had to jettison some of his best material at the last minute. And, uh, but but um, he rose to the occasion, and I understand he pulled it together, and the lecture was a big success. Uh, for the French, this just confirmed their suspicions, I guess. <laughs> uh, I think Stephen has a really cool wheelchair. Um, he has a joystick that he uses to control the chair, and once he gets going, he can really move along at a pretty good clip, and you need to walk briskly to keep up with him. And he's very adroit at maneuvering it through small spaces. He knows just where he can go and where he can't. He has a Pentium computer on board. It actually says Intel inside, right there next to the screen. Uh, Gordon Moore was very pleased to see that the other night. <laughs> he carries his batteries with him. He recharges them at night and gets a charge that's good for the whole day. And there's even a cell phone on the chair. Uh, he'd rather you didn't call him right now, though. Uh, the voice we heard, Stephen has been using since 1985. He used to be embarrassed because he thought he sounded like an American. Um, but I don't hear him complaining about that so much in recent years. You know, I'm not sure he's the only one using this voice. I, recently, I, I made a, a call to order something through a catalog, and Stephen answered. <laughs> and Stephen said, if you want to place an order, press 1. And I, uh, Stephen, you know, what are you doing in catalog sales? <laughs> anyway, um, that reminds me, uh, when uh, Stephen has to 
uh, speak, of course, it takes him a while to put a sentence together, and therefore he's learned to express himself in a very succinct way and not to waste any words. So the, some, the result of that sometimes is that his statements seem a little uh, oracular, you might say. Uh, you sometimes you wonder whether he really knows that what he's saying is true or whether he's just making a guess. And I think sometimes he is just guessing, but boy, a lot of the time he turns out to be right. It can be fun to argue with Stephen. Uh, you enter an argument with him at your peril, of course. Uh, sometimes that uh, unexpected, devastating response comes that sort of brings the argument to a close all of a sudden. And uh, he can be pretty tough in the clinches. So I always try to remember that uh, if, if he gets mad, he can roll that chair right over my toes. So I'm, <laughs> I've, I've learned to keep my distance. So I think maybe, are you, is Stephen still working on the answer? Yes. Okay. <laughs> anyway, no. Are you ready, Stephen? Yes. Okay, so uh, our first question was, how, in Stephen's opinion, are we going to get the answer to this question of do black holes destroy information or not in particular, are we just going to be able to figure it out by pure thought? And this is Stephen's answer. You tell me how we should decide whether information is lost. You have a bet with Kip and me that information is not lost. I will accept your thought, but do you want experimental evidence? It might be dangerous to get that near to a black hole. Well, you can see why I was so interested in this question. Um, there's a lot at stake in this for me. Um, by now, Kip probably has a question ready, so I'm going like, to let Kip take over, and then I'll work on finding the next question. So here's Kip Thorne. Well, this is a question that I have some vested interest in, so I'm glad to see that uh, somebody out there was ready to ask it. Uh, uh, for uh, some time, Stephen Hawking and I have been going back and forth uh, over the issue of will time travel be possible? Initially, I thought the laws of physics wouldn't forbid it, and uh, he he uh, set me straight that they would forbid it, and then he changed his mind, then I changed my mind. So I would like to know uh, what the story is. What do you believe today, Stephen? Uh, do the fundamental laws of physics completely forbid time travel or not? And while uh, Stephen is preparing his answer, I I'm not as good at, uh, at uh, uh, doing these kinds of things as John is. Uh, but let me uh, try a bit. What I would like to do is talk a, a little bit about how Stephen uh, does his research. Uh, you know, in our field, mathematics is a key to uh, research. It's a central tool, and you can imagine that uh, with uh, Stephen being unable to write equations down, and you know, what I tend to do is write down a whole page of equations, then go back and look at this piece and that piece and the other piece and see how they fit together and then write down several more pages trying to make the patterns fit. And that's not easy if, uh, if you can't write. And so uh, the issue is how, how can he do research of this sort? Well, there's a lot more to research in theoretical physics than mathematics. Perhaps the most important thing for a scientist is to know what are the right questions to ask. And Stephen is a real master at that. Time and again, he has identified the questions that will lead to the greatest insights and the greatest progress in understanding the physical laws of the universe. The second step is to be able to guess the answer. If you can't at least guess the answer in advance and sort of how the answer is going to work out, then yes. you have to exp Oh, you're going to give me an answer I'm already? I'm to hear from the future. One more time. I didn't get it because I was too busy talking to Stephen.
I'm waiting to hear from the future. Well, I'm shocked. <laughs> I'm shocked. I think we need to make a bet. <laughs> this is a serious issue because it's an issue about the fundamental nature of time. Let me just uh, ask John, are you ready with another question already? Okay, so while John's coming up, let me just wind up by saying Stephen is superb at guessing the answers in advance on his way uh, uh, and then by guessing the answers, identifying the right path through the mathematics to get to uh, a, a test of whether or not his guess was correct. And then the other thing that he does is he translates his questions, the mathematics, into geometry, and he manipulates geometrical forms and shapes in his head, which is a form of mathematics that he is far better at than probably anyone who has ever lived. He's far better at it because he can't, uh, doesn't, because he's lost the facility to write down the mathematical equations, and so he has developed this alternative uh, set of uh, mathematical tools of working with mathematical shapes, forms, topologies in his head, uh, and uh, this has enabled him to answer questions that nobody else could hope to answer uh, by conventional means. And so, in fact, Stephen has turned adversity into a real advantage over the rest of us poor mortals. Uh, I'll let you ask your question, John. Well, I guess one thing we've learned tonight is the answer to an often asked question, how many Caltech professors did it take to pick a card? Uh, I guess neither Kip nor I were quite up to the task uh, by himself, but, but between the two of us, we're managing here. Stephen, since you answered the first two questions correctly, you can... Mm, mm. You're, you're now ready to advance to the next round. And if I understand correctly, you're going to uh, bet all your winnings on this, uh, on this next question. Is, is that your decision? So I'm holding in my hand the next question, selected uh, from... Yes. <laughs> selected from uh, the audience questions, and it is, did space-time exist before the Big Bang? No. <laughs> All right, I'm dying up here, Kip. Give me a question. <laughs> John, I'm going to give you another chance at the podium. I'll give you another question. All right, uh, this one says, my five-year-old grandson has asked me, if a spaceman could get into a black hole, could he see light? So that's Stephen's next question. It, it yes. <laughs> well, Kip's, uh, Kip's doing great over there. Um, but you know, this question reminds me of something. We hear a lot these days about uh, technology transfer at the universities. Uh, professors are supposed to be taking on the responsibility to serve our institutions and the public welfare by developing new products and bringing them to market. Well, you might think that Stephen is a rather poor candidate for technology transfer, considering you know, he works on black holes and so on. But actually, he has a, he has a plan. Uh, Stephen is applying to patent the Big Bang. And it's a pretty good idea. You see, because anyone who wants to use the universe will have to pay royalties. Mm -hmm. Well, Kip's still hard at work. Okay. Um, so Kip was telling you a little bit about Stephen's research. Oh, okay. We got a question coming. Yeah. Okay. So Kip's in charge. Uh, we have uh, several questions of the same sort. Let me rephrase these questions in the same way. It was recently announced that there is a, 
uh, observational evidence uh, based on observations of supernovae in the very distant universe. Observational evidence that the universe is, in fact, uh, not only expanding, but as time goes on, it expands faster and faster, which was quite a surprise, if it's uh, really correct, because uh, we have, all, have always long thought that it uh, would expand slower and slower. So the question to Stephen is, uh, uh, could, could you uh, give us your views on this? Is this uh, a, a plausible result? One, one thing that, that theoretical physicists often do is they look at an experimental result and they say, is that plausible or not? And if it's highly implausible, then they uh, push the experimenters to do it much more carefully. Is this a plausible result? And if so, does it tell us anything exciting? So while Stephen is talking about that, let me talk just a little bit about this bet that was referred to uh, between, that involves the issue of whether or not information is really lost down black holes. This is an interesting uh, issue. It's an issue that Stephen raised in his research uh, uh, the first time when he was here as the Sherman Char Fairchild uh, Scholar in 1975. And the world's physicists have struggled with that question since then. It's tremendously important because if information is lost down a black hole, then the laws of quantum mechanics, as we have always formulated them, are wrong. And that is extremely disturbing to one community of theoretical physicists. Physicists uh, break up into communities depending upon their backgrounds. John Preskill comes from the community of theoretical physicists who uh, cut their teeth on quantum mechanics. They work on the theory of fundamental particles. They're called particle theorists. And they believe firmly that the laws of quantum mechanics, that after all, they've spent their life uh, working with, they've got to be right. You don't waste, want to have wasted all your life. Uh, <laughs> there, there are those of us like Stephen and I who come from a different community. Uh, we come from the relativity community uh, where uh, our roots are deeply in the area of warped space-time. And uh, we would be quite pleased to see the standard quantum mechanics be wrong. It wouldn't be all that disturbing. Uh, and, uh, and so quite naturally, when Stephen found very strong evidence that information is lost down black holes and standard quantum mechanics is wrong, uh, the community that he and I have our roots in uh, were rather cheering for this. And uh, John Preskill and his community were uh, aghast. And uh, in fact, uh, both communities have joined forces vigorously working on this issue uh, for the last, uh, well, very vigorously for the last 10 years or so, uh, and uh, at a lower rate but, uh, but considerable effort for the preceding 10 years. We still don't know the answer, but it's uh, tremendously fundamental to issues such as uh, the beginning of the universe, because uh, the nature of uh, the beginning of the universe depends on what precisely the quantum mechanical laws are. And hence the bet, previous bets involving Stephen and me, uh, of course Stephen has lost them all. Uh, um, uh, this time uh, I s swung over uh, with Stephen. In previous bets, uh, John and I have been on the same side and Stephen has been the loser to us. Uh, this time I swung over because my roots are in, in the relativity side, the warped space-time side, swung over with Stephen and I'm rooting for him to win. Uh, and uh, we will see whether having me on his side finally brings him luck. <laughs> um, how are you coming, Stephen? Are you finished? No. No. Okay. Then uh, let me uh, talk a bit about uh, how Stephen interacts with colleagues on scientific research. Um, Research in theoretical physics is uh, uh, usually done much more effectively with colleagues than working alone. There are some people who work tremendously well alone, but there are very few. You really need a colleague to bounce ideas back and forth with, and uh, that uh, makes new ideas bubble up more quickly and enables you to discard unfruitful ideas more easily. And so Stephen has long had a number of collaborators, sometimes his uh, own graduate students, postdoctoral students working with him. Most recently, in recent months, a man named Neil Turok, who's a, a senior a scientist uh, sort, uh, in his, uh, I guess, late 30s at Cambridge. 
Uh, you might wonder, what is it like to do scientific research with him when the key idea is throwing ideas back and forth, and it does take him uh, as long as you see to prepare a, a sentence. But of course, what you have to remember first is that each sentence is a real jewel, typically. And each sentence uh, gives you enough food for thought uh, that you can sort of sit back and quietly contemplate uh, it and its implications while he's preparing the next sentence. So when you're working with one-on-one -on -one with him, there are long, quiet periods while he's preparing remarks and you're thinking about what he said. And then you may go into a fit of arguing with him in which you just declaim for uh, several minutes uh, on why he's wrong. Uh, and then you wait impatiently uh, for the reply to come out. Uh, but often it's a two-on-one situation uh, uh, in which then, say, John Preskill and I will argue back and forth with each other while Stephen is preparing his answers, and that often brings out uh, further uh, fruitful new, point, new points of view, uh, having this conversation going on on the side while Stephen is preparing his remarks. But then as soon as he uh, launches his remarks, you quickly focus in on those remarks and uh, then discuss them uh, with each other. And so, in fact, working with Stephen is a little different mode than working with uh, uh, other people, but it's a mode which uh, you soon learn can be highly fruitful and uh, really very enjoyable. Clearly, this answer is uh, going to be quite complicated. Um, Stephen is a very adventurous person. Uh, last, uh, spring, uh, last spring, about a year ago, uh, he and I received an invitation uh, from a colleague, Claudio Teitelboim in Chile, to go to a conference in the Antarctica. The conference was to be held in Antarctica in August. Well, uh, I got a little concerned. Uh, my Lonely Planet uh, guide to Antarctica begins the first page saying, when do you go to Antarctica? Tourists do not go in the wintertime. August is the wintertime. This didn't faze Stephen. He said yes immediately. Uh, and uh, so Stephen and I and a few other colleagues went to Antarctica in August, uh, which is the dead of winter there, well, late winter. The Antarctic ice sheet was just breaking up on King George Island on the uh, tip of the Antarctic Peninsula uh, where we went. It was a conference that was held for two days in San Diego, Chile, and one day uh, in Antarctica uh, on King George Island. Uh, it was uh, sponsored by uh, the uh, Theoretical uh, Physics Institute, uh, or the Institute for Advanced Studies in Santiago, Chile, jointly with the uh, Chilean Air Force. And this was an interesting aspect of it. Uh, the uh, head of the uh, Institute for Advanced Study in Chile is a man who is the son of Minister of State, a communist Minister of State in the Allende regime in Chile. So he is now, in fact, science advisor to uh, President Fry of Chile. Uh, and this uh, conference served a number of purposes. Bring Stephen Hawking there, he gave a lecture to 6,000 people uh, in a, a converted railway station uh, as a tremendous inspiration to uh, young people particularly. Uh, to encourage young people uh, who might have some interest in science. So it did serve that purpose. But it also served the purpose that the only way to go to the Antarctica was courtesy of the Air Force. And this was, uh, in fact, Claudio's reaching out a hand of friendship to the Air Force in a period when still there is enormous tension between the Chilean military and uh, the uh, uh, civilian government. And Claudio, as the son of a communist minister in the I.N.